Hey guys, no, you're not seeing double. I now have two Tektronix 465 scopes. Now this guy I got, jeez, I don't know, I think it was the first piece of test equipment I got um, when I got back into this hobby probably 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, and I've never done anything with it. I plugged it in and it worked well enough for what I need, but it definitely has some quirks and it could use some servicing. Um, so I've been teasing, getting into doing TV alignments and doing a sort of a tutorial series. Well, as part of that, I had to choose a scope. Now I know a lot of you guys out there have uh, a multitude of scopes. Um, I like to keep things lean and simple, and I just want to have one scope on my workbench. I'll keep a couple others for backups, but for the kind of work I do, which is pretty narrow, generally radios from the 30s through the 50s and TVs from the 40s through the 60s, this is more than adequate. Uh, and the, the other reason I chose a 465 is it's ubiquitous. They made a ton of these, and there's plenty of them around inexpensive and there are loads of YouTube videos about how to use them and how to service them and these are serviceable unlike the later scopes that uh, get more and more exotic and use more and more proprietary parts. Um, I thought about maybe getting a newer tech scope like a 2467 something like that something that has on-screen display and more features but then you get back to that problem of if something goes wrong, I probably wouldn't be able to fix it, and I probably would have spent a lot of money on it, and, uh, well, anyways, this is what I'm going to go with. Even as this is, with its issues, it's still plenty sufficient for the kind of stuff I'm talking about doing. But, um, I think it could use a little, a little bit of overhaul. Um, at least clean out the dust bunnies, and I've been warned I should lubricate the cooling fan. So what is this? This is a classic, very popular, very well selling, very well designed, dual trace, 100 megahertz analog scope that was introduced in the early 70s, and they made it for years, uh, several slight variations, a military version, there's a newer version with better capabilities, there's a version that has a multimeter built into the top, uh, it's a classic. It's a classic, so I figured I can't go wrong. The other reason I want to use it too is um, when you get into doing alignment, uh, things can get pretty complicated. I'm trying to use equipment, demonstrate equipment that you guys can get. Some of the stuff I have, you'd have um, some trouble getting uh, getting your hands on it. Like I have this fancy XY monitor with a big display that I'm going to demonstrate, but it took me years to find one. And you guys are <laughs> will probably also have to spend years to find one, if you could ever find one. So I'm going to demonstrate using this. So some of the key things that I, that I wanted in a scope. Um, decent bandwidth, 100 megahertz is plenty. Dual trace, I won't need it very often, but it's nice to have. XY mode is essential. you got to have that for doing alignments. Um, some of this stuff like the dual time base and delay and all and, and zoom, I don't really need it, but it's nifty. I've seen guys demonstrating, uh, showing video signals and zooming in on different portions and stuff. And you know, if you can, it's certainly uh, a nice thing to have. So I've been reading up a bit on these. So this one in particular, it turns on, it works, but some of the vertical ranges have issues, and I guess it's a common problem. They need to be cleaned. That is not easy. They used a rather odd switching system for the voltage ranges. It's not a rotary switch. It's a cam with gold-plated leafs that you know, move up and down to make contact. And those get dirty. I imagine if, if it was around a smoker, contamination. You know, gold plating is nice, but if you get gunk on the gold plating, causes the problem. Now you can't just shoot contact cleaner in there. I've been warned about that too. <laughs> like I said, I've been doing my homework. Um, it's not easy to get at them and to clean them. Uh, apparently isopropyl alcohol 
as the way to go with that, but we'll get into that later. Um, the other stuff, I, I think the calibration is off, and it doesn't trigger as well as I think it should. Uh, and in general, I think it's probably all original. I could probably use a recap and uh, just some other general maintenance. Um, touch up the calibration, make sure the power supply rails are within spec and so on. Alright, so I decided that, okay, I'm going to go with this scope. It's nice to have a backup. And I saw somebody local to me selling, I think they had four of these. Uh, I think they were about 40 bucks each. And, uh, I don't know, 20 bucks for shipping. Now, <laughs> I had a feeling that the cheap shipping was going to come at a, a bit of a penalty. Yeah, they just threw this in a cardboard box with virtually no padding. But it arrived, and cosmetically, I could see from their listing, it's in great condition. Every knob is here. Uh, often you see them where the knobs are, are busted, missing. Uh, it's pretty clean. It's actually cleaner than the one I've been using. Um, it has this weird pouch thing on top. I that's where you can put your probes. Uh, my other one never came with it. Um, and uh, all the feet are there. Uh, they're kind of busted off on this one. That's why it's flopping around. Uh, but it was listed as not working. Now, I've purchased plenty of test equipment that was used as that it was not working or untested. So a lot of sellers, they just buy stuff in bulk and they flip it. They, don't, they wouldn't know how to test it. They wouldn't know how to tell if it's working or not. Uh, if it's cheap enough, I'll take a gamble. If it doesn't work, oh well, maybe I can fix it. Maybe I can just scavenge check for the, just for the knobs. It's, or you know, the handle and all the hardware and stuff. It's a decent enough deal. I wanted to just keep this one running, but I'm hoping I can get it working too. So um, I thought I heard something rattling around inside. So the first thing I want to do is pop this open, give it a visual inspection, and if I don't see anything that worries me, try turning it on. Let's we'll see if we can get some life out of it. If it doesn't work, I'll uh, try doing some basic troubleshooting on it, see if we can get it working. All right, uh, let's see, get you up on what I've done. Remove one Phillips screw and the top pouch just completely comes off. And then remove the feet on the back. There's a Phillips screw down each one. And then the back comes off. Uh, actually, I mean the whole cover slides off. Let's get the handle all the way. Oh yeah, I like the older check scopes better in one regard. We had side panels that came off much easier to deal with. Stupid power cord, you gotta thread down through the cabinet. Huh, but anyways, got it out. Now first thing I'd want to check is check the uh, the settings for the input voltage. You can do uh I've got 115 versus 220 switch on the side and a finer one on the back. You can loosen up these two screws and move this whole block to a different position if needed. Right now I'm in the 105 to 126 range, which is just fine. Let's see if any other signs of trouble. Out of the way. I'll power this up uh, without the case on so I can check for any issues. Alright. So that's the power switch, which is a, a rather interesting design. So there's a little knob on the front that you pull, and it just has a long shaft that goes to a toggle switch towards the back. So that's okay. It's power transformer. I don't think it's neat about this. If you look really close, these transistors are all actually socketed. There are little, like, eyelet kind of things on the circuit board that the transistors fit into. So if they needed to get replaced, it wouldn't be a big an ordeal. There's a cooling fan, motor. Uh, there are those vertical attenuators I was talking about. They're underneath these covers. 
So you need to disassemble this to clean it, which is uh, not trivial. Okay, so that's just a rub against the cabinet to, to ground it. So make sure everything's seated. Look for any popped tantalum caps. See, yes, it does, does have some. A crack in the epoxy on that one. Might have vented. I was really going to be using one of these all day as, and, uh, as part of my workbench. I would recommend replacing a tantalum cap, so I may very well go through and do that. The other thing to replace are the five electrolytic caps down here. Uh, so, serviceable, yes, but that doesn't mean things aren't a little tricky to get at. <laughs> um, but compared to later models, uh, this is definitely serviceable. Right, what's going on back here? There's the big old odd looking cap. Of course, we got the CRT running down the middle. I tried to make this as short as possible, but the CRT just goes all the way back to the very back of the uh, case. All right, well, I'm not seeing any anything that, I'm not, I don't smell anything burnt. I don't see any popped caps. I don't see any abandoned repair attempts. So, uh, I say we just go for it. Okay, here we go. It's plugged in and turned on. Tell if the fan is running or not. Uh, so, oh, beam finder works. Uh, let's see, channel one. It's way off. There it is. Whoa. Okay, we're not triggering. Next white mode. Let's get this thing. Auto trigger. Mm -hmm. Hey. Got some focus. We have focus. We have intensity. Uh, turn off the magnification. Uh, Have more width. I don't remember how you do that. Let me grab a scope probe and hook it up to the built in calibrator. That's funny, I had one of these for years and I couldn't get into the higher voltage ranges. And <laughs> this is my ignorance, I didn't realize it because I bought cheapo Chinese. Generic scope probe. Didn't realize a real Tektronics probe has a pin that sticks out. When you engage that, it tells the scope that you're in times 10 mode, and it en enables the lower, the uh, sorry, the upper ranges, while disabling the lower ranges. Uh, well, that's not good. Oh, I have ground. Hey. There it is. And can we get it? And it triggers. That shouldn't, it should look a lot better than that. Let me uh, rearrange things so you guys have a better view of what's going on. But hey, so far, I don't know why they listed this as not working for parts only. That might have issues, but it certainly turns on and kind of sort of works. Like I was saying, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's your money, so I can't tell you to just gamble and throw it away potentially, but I've been lucky more often than not, and with a little bit of f fiddling, can get stuff to work that I get very inexpensively. Now, that being said, uh, 
even if it was in pristine condition and listed as fully working, there's not, these aren't worth that much. I mean, one that was fully checked out and all that, maybe you'd spend two, three hundred bucks on it. Um, and another reason I went with this is I was thinking, well, maybe I'd get a nicer, higher end one that was serviced or I'd send it somewhere if I could get it serviced for a few hundred bucks. I can't find anybody that services vintage tech scopes. The one place that did no longer takes any new business. So you're kind of stuck with <laughs> uh, doing it yourself. Alright, so let's just on Cal. Can we get this? Alright, so I can vary the time base. Lock. So when I do that, it's changing the width of this. But when it's calibrated, it's only filling up half the screen. I'm probably doing something stupid, it's just a little rusty with using this scope. So we got this position. It seems like there should be a width control somewhere. None of the buttons were pushed in for the horizontal display, I think. One of them is supposed to be, but now that I have, I can't get it to do anything. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it should be trigger auto. gets it back. I got to say so far other than me not being able to get this full width and uh, a little bit of the curve on the score wave that is works better than my other scope. Some scope probes have an adjustable trimmer cap you can do to square up the square wave, but this one doesn't appear to have it. That's not quite the right scope probe for the scope. It's a 400 megahertz probe. It's a little bit superior. This must have a compensation on it somewhere, doesn't it? Is it through that little hole in the side? Maybe it is. Uh, well, let's try out channel two. Hey, channel two's giving me full width. I know I'm doing something stupid because this has a mode where you can have A trigger into B and I'm, I'm only getting half the screen because it's not transitioning right. It should just be doing A channel A only and I just don't remember how to do all the modes right. <laughs> uh, oops, single suit. I mean, this, this thing seems to be fully functional to me. Even all the voltage ranges, uh, they're not flaky. Let's see. 
Yep, triggering, plus minus. And the knobs, the controls feel nice. <laughs> like this thing has been cleaned. Like just even that, it feels nice. Scale illumination works. Not for a second there, maybe the bulb was burned out. No. Very cool. <laughs> well, I think this suddenly got promoted to being my main scope. I just rediscovered how to use one of the niftiest features on the scope, uh, something I didn't understand for a long time, not until fairly recently when I watched some tutorials on the scope and it finally clicked. And that is what this is all about in this control up here. So right now we're looking at just um, one channel, the square wave test signal, and we can change the time base. And we can change the, the voltage range, right? Well, there's something else you can do with this. I'm feeding channel B under the same signal. We can have some fun with that. So when you pull this out, there's a second time base. And you can have it kick in somewhere along here. So you can look at part of the waveform with one time scale and another part of the same waveform with a different time scale simultaneously. Ah, and to do that we want to go into mix mode. And, hey, now when I pull this out I'm changing the time base on the right hand side. And now I'm changing it for the whole thing. When you let go, when they you, just, you start rotating it, the two, when they hit each other, they lock together. So now I'm doing both. The intensity, that's when the second time base kicks in. And that's what this changes. So let me change that again. So now as I change this, it's changing where that second time base setting kicks in. I saw a nifty example using uh, looking at an NTSC signal and they zoomed in on the color burst portion of it. It was kind of a neat thing. How often would this be of practical use? I don't know, but it took some very clever, clever engineering to implement this and they used it in a number of models. Um, so it must have some, some uses <laughs> that I hope to discover as I use this scope more and more. Now, if you've been watching my videos, you've seen that my go-to scope for a long time was a Hewlett Packard digital scope, one of the early generation digital sampling scopes from the early 90s. I used it in college and I was familiar with it. I got one cheap off of eBay and it just worked. I never had to open it up or do anything to it. It's small, lightweight, and it just goes. But as I got doing more and more with TVs and looking at the video signals, I was realizing that I can't really see any detail, even though it's a 100 megahertz scope, and then one of my, or maybe more than one of my viewers pointed out, 100 megahertz bandwidth, but it's only a 20 megahertz sample rate. And if it's not a repetitive waveform, you just do not get any detail. And I was also only, only 8 bits of resolution, so it's really not that great. So this is older. Um, but it actually shows you more detail on the screen. However, the trade-off with a digital scope, you can just push a button, it'll auto-scale, it'll adjust all these settings for you so you can see a nice waveform, and it will tell you the frequency, the voltage peak-to-peak, -peak, uh, and so on. Now I have to <laughs> go old school, it's been a long time since I've had to do this, and look at the time base. 
and see oh we're at five microseconds per division and the waveform takes up two and a half divisions and then do some math maybe get out a calculator to figure out what the frequency is <laughs> and same with the volts per division okay we're at 10 millivolts per division and we're at uh, one two three or so division so it's 30 millivolts peak to peak that kind of stuff <laughs> however generally for the kind of work I'm doing I'm just looking to see do we have a waveform? Is an oscillator running? Does the, is the wave shape correct? Is the frequency in the right ballpark? So that I think I can I can handle <laughs> as I get more and more familiar with it. But all right, this is fantastic. The last thing I want to try doing is seeing if I can adjust. There's a little hole in the side of these probes, and you can put a tool down in there, a small screwdriver, ideally plastic, and adjust it to flatten out um, that waveform. And it's curious, when I go to channel 2, it's curved this way, and when I go to channel 1, it's curved this way. At channel 1, I'm not using a, a cheapo generic probe, and channel 2 is the expensive Hewlett Packard probe. It's actually meant for higher-end models. It's a 400 megahertz probe, um, which may or may not be an issue with this. So I'm going to find a little tool that will fit down in there. Give it a, I'm just using the metal one. I'll just have to remove it to check it every time. Oh, all right. It's just that simple. Fantabulous. How about channel 2? This one's a little trickier. I really can't see down in that hole to see what kind of tool I should be using. Oh, there we go. Hey! Alright! <laughs> Now I, I need to get some better equipment to check out, the act, make sure the peak-to-peak -peak, uh, voltage is accurate in the various ranges and that the time base is accurate. But dang, that uh, that's one of the best cheap test equipment investments I've ever made. I can't guarantee you'll have the same luck. Um, this was barely packed, but it also only had to be shipped about 40 miles. Uh, if they had a lo I had a local pickup option, I might have gone for it. Um, uh, so I do recommend, if, if at all possible, um, pick it up in person. And of course, if they can demonstrate it being turned on, you know, absolutely. But 465, they made thousands and thousands of them. They've been liquidated from so many labs and universities over the years. Um, they made them for for over a decade, I think. So they're 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 out there for sure. And I've seen plenty of other YouTubers have one up on their workbench. It seems like that's the thing to have, along with a Fluke 27 FM. You know, these two just <laughs> um, you know, bulletproof workhorses. It's hard to go wrong. All right, very very cool. I hope you enjoyed this this quick look at a 465. Um, I'll give you a little last visual tour of it, uh, and then I need to watch some uh, videos more about um, how to do some basic servicing. Like I was told to lube the fan. I don't know how to. I, I don't know where exactly to do it. Or uh, cleaning certain controls or replacing certain caps preemptively. You know, it's it's tempting to say, hey, it just works, put the cover back on and keep using it. But I'd hate to have something go up in smoke in a month. Part of the beauty, beauty of these tech scopes, the reason they work so well, is they made their own CRTs and they put a ton of R&D effort into them. Some of the higher end models actually use ceramic bodies so they can get them super, a super precise geometry. And that, that's that flat thing I was wondering about earlier, that's a coupling cap to a deflection plate. Notice there's a hole in the side there, that's where the deflection plates, they come out of the side of the CRT, so they have as little capacitance as possible. That goes right through the glass, right through the deflection plate on the CRT right there, rather than going through the base, which would add capacitance and inductance. Oh, and now we can get a better view of the <laughs> voltage range. <laughs> Thing with little nubs sticking out. Oh yeah, and you can kind of see, you can see the switch action there too. Sort of like little leaf springs and cams. Mine seems to be working. I'm not going to mess with it. I'd love to get in there and replace some of these caps. I guess you can get a big long electrolytic in here. Ah, and those tantalums do do worry me. 
So all those little blobs with multi colors on them, those are tantalum caps which tend to pop uh, when they fail. And the old, older they are, the more likely they are to fail. They use them because they do that super low ESR. And we have the uh, five electrolytics there, which have kind of an odd base. Somebody actually made a PCB adapter base for them, kind of like the adapter cap thing, uh, just for tech and uh, HP scopes. You can get them on uh, eBay. All oh, those chips are socketed too. So it wasn't obvious at first. So they're not socket sockets, they're like eyelets they put into the PCB and then the chips go into that. And Tektronics made their own chips, or at least, well, designed them and had somebody fab them for them, but they do have Tektronics logos on them. Oh, these these switches are pretty, pretty trippy too. These mode lever switches here, when you turn them. Uh, kind of a <laughs> crazy uh, action there. Why didn't they use the old ceramic big rotary clunker things? Because it you want to minimize lead length and ductance capacitance and make them reliable as possible. Gold plated connectors everywhere. Oh yeah, and there's the fan motor. It's it's an odd motor. It's very quiet. So that's the actual shaft of it coming out there. And there's impeller blades on the other side. Well, this thing only consumes a max of 75 watts, so it doesn't exactly get hot anyways. And the power supply is over here, but the fan's over there. But and there seems to be <laughs> vertical channels this way, so I'm not exactly sure what is important to be cooled. I suppose the vertical deflection amps is what they're really trying to cool here. Well, I'm going to leave off here and do some more homework. Uh, I'd love to read your comments and thoughts and suggestions about this scope. I know some of you uh, out there already have one because I've already seen you mention it when I posted a photo of it. And I'm uh, so curious what you think about my decision to go with this. Um, uh, actually, I'll close it out with a, a few th additions to that. It's about why don't I get a new scope? One of the flat LCD digital ones that's only that deep, get them for under a grand. Um, I like analog scopes. To me, this is new. I'm used to working on stuff that's decades older than this, even. Um, and also, uh, I'm afraid of frying if I drop, say, 750 bucks on a modern scope and I accidentally brush some circuit that has a thousand volts on it. The whole thing could just go up. Just the whole thing could get annihilated and I'm out of the money. This would survive it. Um, I'm sh sure there are higher end modern scopes that can take more abuse, but I, I don't, I don't want to risk it. And, uh, you know, hey, it works. 40 bucks. I don't need all those fancy features. I don't need built in FFTs and four channels of different color displays, traces and all that. Yes, it's cool. They're neat, <laughs> beautiful displays to look at, but hey, I like this. So that's what I'm going to use.